Welcome to the Metal Voice. You know, a real special guest, a guy I've wanted to have on for a very long time, been following the band Agent Steel for many, many years. Uh, John Cyrus. What's going on, John? Hey, thanks for having me on. It's yeah, good to yeah. be here. Some cool, exciting news. Uh, you're working on a new album, correct? Yes. Uh there's a GoFundMe page for the new album, which is cool, right? So fans can get involved. Um, I'm going to ask you about the new album, and then we'll kind of dive into a little bit of the history of the band and your beginnings, if that's okay with you. Sure. Sounds good. So first of all, uh, tell me about the new album. You know, where are you going with this? Uh, when do you expect to release it? And, uh, you know, all the information about it, you know, that you can in terms of, I don't know, sound, direction. ETA. Yeah, well, um, ever since uh, we finished up work with some some new talent that I just stumbled upon in 2020, um, this this last album, uh, mm -hmm. "No Other Gods Before Me." Um, when even before its release, I thought, you know, well, you know we're we're up against some pretty heavy hitters nowadays because there's so many bands out there um it's the competition is incredible i mean i don't consider it a competition because there's so many you know there's so many great new bands and so much talent so it's all about you know diversity and uh i guess whoever you know comes on if they want to recreate a, you know some a, like some sound in a, from the genre you know that's that's cool but it's all about being original i guess uh it's where it depends on um you know the future of 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 the uh outfit um but you know yeah there's just it's a lot of bands <laughs> and you can see that there's you know the, the the festivals you got the the big guys you know the head honchos the people that have you know stayed that have been resilient and stayed on you know, the Megadeths and, uh, you know, hate breed and you got all, you know, the standard bands that have stayed with it and have lasted the test of time. And then you have a hundred other bands that you never heard of. So, you know, based on that sense of overcrowding, um, I mean, considering the overcrowding, I thought that, um, we might, you know, I'm, if I'm, if I was going to do another age of steel album, it would have to be something that was unique and stood that and and somehow was able to stand up to the um the uh how would i say this the the legacy of the early albums well yeah well would not uh, no actually i was thinking outside the box as far as that okay all right <laughs> i got it wrong <laughs> yeah yeah i was thinking i was thinking i you know nowadays you know, just if you compare, for example, Exodus, which is one of my favorite bands of all time. Gary mm -hmm. Holt is an incredible guitarist, you know, great stand up guy and everything. Um, if you compare you know, some of their first albums, even Bonded by Blood, and you compare the, the latest albums or, you know, the albums he's made in the last 10 years. I mean, the guitar work has evolved incredibly. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's still great music. Bonded by Blood is just uh, all ultimate classic album and that started exodus's journey that's you know lasted so long and you know but the evolution of gary's guitar work and his songwriting um and the band's overall skill you know in the evolution that you know during that journey is really of there's a wide there's a large gray area between the, that first album and the material that he's been making the last 10 years and even the latest album. So if you're going to be there and you're going to stand up to, you know, if you're going to be able to cut the mustard um, and even if you're somebody that's got a name or, you know, somebody that's, you know, the mega deaths or whatever um, you're going to have, you know, basically that's what you're up against. You know what I'm saying? So it's like, listen, any new bands that are part of that hundred, band shuffle that comes on these festivals that nobody's ever heard of that there's some great talent there and there's some 
you know, others sure, that absolutely. I don't know. I haven't seen them all. So, no, but, I get you what know, you're saying. So, so I, so I thought with, with, I thought with no other gods before me, I thought, you know, I need to go a notch above. I need to do something that I need to come up with something that is going to put me in a category where, um, there's an evolution there. I didn't want to make, you know, in other words, X, you know, basically what I'm trying to say at the end of the day here, um, or at the beginning of this interview is that, um, Exodus isn't going to make, isn't going to re-record an album like, just like Bonded by Blood in 2023. Mm -hmm. They're, 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 they've continued to evolve. They've got, there's new recording technology now. There's different equipment. Um, nobody uses, um, uh the uh the old audio the old um uh real to system, real. you know the, the, yeah exactly but uh, yeah it's just all it's everything's done digital there's all kinds of advanced technology that's coming out every day you know with pro tools and uh there's a lot of editing that's you know incredible it's stuff that just resembles pure magic that's done by even the basic you know not engineer who's who's got his line of work together that wasn't available even to a Max Norman maybe back in in the eighties you know where he could get a great sound you know with you know and then you got the Heaven and Hell albums and his stuff has just resilient you know um, sound but I mean it's just deep and it's the sound is um, wide it's, it's a wide sound as opposed to nowadays everything's more compact because of digital and it's um it's less you know there's a less there's it's it, it's not as as roomy as, as it used to be but at the same time nobody's making albums like heaven and hell and bond of my blood anymore that's a good point. engineering wise production wise so i needed to do something that was different with no other guys before me so i think that i you know it came out pretty good in my opinion i think it's one of the best asian steel albums now yeah the thing that, about the new album is is that it's it it's going to be more raw. It's not going to have as many, it's not going to be as, as you know, effect based as uh, No Other Gods was because um, the material itself was written in a very raw format. Um, the, 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 the songwriter that is the main songwriter that, is, that compiled most of the material is very uh, old school as far as his his sound and, and his writing, there's not much room there to really make it really, you know, high tech space, spacey, really effects wise. You know, it's, it's going to be more raw. It's going to be more like uh, mad locust rising, so to say uh, the EP, but at the same time, there's a lot of ambience. There's a lot of, you know, tempo changes and he's an incredible guitarist. And, um, you know, yeah, it's just like uh, Nikolay, the guitarist. I had another guy before me. He's an incredible talent. And, uh, you know, great guy on top of it. And it was great working with him. And, um, you know, this in this situation the, with the new album, it's even more, um, it's going to be more, even more unique. But it's, it, yeah, it, it, it's going to be a surprise because uh, there are it's a lot of material there that's um, actually a little darker than all the other Agent Steel albums. Um, there's some material on there that resembles, uh, let's say, uh, you know, a 20, you know, more like a 2023 merciful fate or um oh nice you know even, yeah so yeah there's going to be some different kind of things on there and some subject that definitely darker than than the other albums including no other gods so yeah where, where are you at sort of in the recording process is it you're just have the songs they're recorded the songs you're at the mixing stage like what stage are you at on this new new album that we're talking about The, the songs, yeah, they've been done for a while, for over a year, but um, all the material, all the basic tracks that were recorded, um, it's been patched in and then and recorded by different, you know, recorded by different engineers um, that have actually used amping in the studio to, you know, recreate the, the some of the guitar sounds. And um, it's all basically done uh except the you know I've, I've gone through different mix down phases where um you know i thought well let's try to add some more effects but then an engineer that i work with suggested that i 
I um, add less effects, you know, that make it yeah. more raw and just overall just more, you know, um, more eighties old school, so to say. But um, I, you know, the yeah, the vocals are are pretty much done. There's some things I do over because I keep coming up with different ideas, and I think. You know, I wasn't able to do that with no gods. It was kind of in a rush situation because of a of a plastic head. Um, you know, the the label they were in a rush to get it out. So um, this time, you know, I'm going to take my time, and I think I'm going to make sure that everything I'm going to you know go over all the um, details, and if there's things, and I'm going to just I, I get mixes, and I kind of meditate on it and then i leave it for a couple days and then i get back to it and i listen to it again and i see i i hear things that i think could be done better and um you know i flip-flop a lot about it but i i, I want to make it as perfect as possible as far as the vision that I, that i had for you know it's for for the final product so uh which you know changes a lot so i'm just trying to make it better and better as i as i go along and that's and that's the reason for the gofundme too because it's been difficult to um to land a label for its release because there's um some strange things going on out there um in you know the scene or the industry whatever you want to call it that uh it just seems like there's some opposition for uh releasing another agent steel album or for having released one at all even no other gods before me in 2021 there just seems like I don't know exactly where it, it it comes from, who is involved, but you know, call it conspiracy theories or not, or whatever you want to call it. Definitely, there is some some form of conspiracy, or if you want to call it, an opposing cabal. Of some <laughs> well, kind. pure agent steel fashion, yeah. right? What are you going to do? <laughs> yeah, well, you know, I think this time it's coming from. It could it could be coming from. It could be anything from it could be peers mm -hmm. to uh, some, you know, some politically correct or, you know, politically correct group that is stern in their philosophy. And they think that I, I'm just my thinking is just too far outside the box because I've mentioned this in interviews that were uh, published, that were interviews in, in, in text, in mm -hmm. magazines, not like this audio interview. Sure. And I think that there's an incredible hypocrisy that is alive in the metal music industry today. You know, um, I don't even know if I should go there, but I would like to talk about this because I was thinking about what I should talk about during this interview. And I'm kind of, going, you know, kind of just sprouted some wings here i'm like flying in between all the trenches like if he's ever seen the uh you know the uh, the exorcist 2 the heretic long time ago that it was a second exorcist with sequel. the lotus and with the lotus when you got flying my friend yeah, exactly and you got the the locust the locusts, flying the in locusts. between all the all the the canyons and and all the um the mountain canyon rock you know mountainous rock trenches in between between in the mountain where uh, the the priest had, you know, tried to lift up this African boy all the way to the top to keep him up there a couple months for the exorcism, and then the locust comes and he, you know, he, he gets on the locust somehow. He rides with him and he shows him all these different places. So it's like I keep looking around and seeing everything that's going on, and I think that everything that I'm seeing that there's an incredible you know, contra contradiction and hypocrisy that was claimed by a um, a group of, of musicians or, you know, the, of some some cabal that's, you know, that maybe we see or we don't see. Maybe they're not the guys on stage playing that have crusaded since the, you know, the onslaught of Venom and then Merciful Faith and Slayer with the kind of, um, more um, the, 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 I wouldn't say darker because, you know, but, you know, they would call it that, but, you know, a, a different philosophy, an alternative to 
religion and especially Christianity is and use and its use the the use of that philosophy in through lyrics and attitude in the in metal, through metal bands and the metal industry in general, um, which was supposed to be we are the um, campaigners or we are the crusaders of free thought of free thinking not restrictive and not and thinking outside the box in you know being able to stimulate thought and attitude in in an occult way in in a darker way in complete rebellion towards organized religion and which means everything goes and a lot of these bands were inspired like slayer jeff hanneman for example by the punk era so it was like punk with an intelligent kind of um yeah. creepy eerie you know um euphoria added to the lyrics and the attitude and the album covers and all that which i thought was very, very cool you know being i'm not i'm not a devout religious person at all you know i i'm more agnostic in it, if anything but um i do believe in that something exists but it definitely um, if there's any kind of energy or power out there, it's definitely, it, it does. I don't believe it has an intelligence. It ha it's just an energy and the energy has to be, that energy has to have a vehicle through which it is directed, through which it is manifest. So just, you know, just to say that real quick. You know, but, I, I think what you're um, trying to I say here, I think what you're trying to say, correct me if I'm wrong here. I'm just trying to sort of summarize this. Mm -hmm. You're trying to say freedom of, of thought or freedom of speech has been, compressed and locked down is that what you're trying to say well no yeah the hypocrisy yeah exactly but in what i want to say is the the hypocrisy comes into play that this group or this clique or cabal or whatever um the death metal the darker because there's death metal that's like punk that just talks about you know that just where the lyrics are about just hating society or mm -hmm. disliking your the na your neighbor or whatever but no when it comes to like um the yeah. darker elements that have been used as a, a not a gimmick but you know most of it is gimmick but there's very few serious people that are involved in that it's just usually like a you know imagery or um a gimmick or whatever that's used to make it more interesting that's following a trend that started with venom and then um slayer merciful fate at the, kind of at the same time but merciful fate came a little a little bit earlier than slayer even though slayer was developing as a club band at the time um that they claim that we are th they think outside the box of especially outside the box of organized religion and and or the razor fist the metal bands like um um uh, but i can't believe i forgot the guy's name this band's name saxon um mm -hmm. and also uh, in opposition to the attitude and objective of whether whether they had a girlfriend or not or whether they were pissed off at society because all the girlies were going over the hair bands that uh, also not following the the, the attitude and, and you know the trend of the glam bands the girl girly bands the yeah. hair band guys that are drawing all the girlies okay so they were outside that box which means that hey everything goes where the hypocrisy lies is that i believe that it's evolved to become a dictatorship so you know you got like a group or a system or a government or as in america a political party that comes in and says and says hey we're completely liberal and uh we like horror movies and we like uh the darker elements of psychology and religion and so everything goes you know as long as you're not like as long as you're not a serial killer or you're not robbing banks and, sh and you're not sh shooting old ladies or killing children everything else is cool and it, the darker you are you're welcome to join us so we don't care what you say you know it's freedom all about and then later you see that this government comes in and after a couple of years or a decade or two you know there's this guy that creates um you know dance music you know uh electronic music a dj and he's mixing um you know uh african-american singers or people of you know women of color that sing kind of bluesy with, um, you know, a heavy metal guitar and, and, and jazz drums. And, um, you know, they come along and say, no, this is wrong. We're only classical music is 
the only way. This is, yeah, you know, you. we're going to have to, we're going to, we're right. going to, you know what I'm saying? So what I'm saying is I'm thinking outside the box and no other gods before me, you know, I come out and I say, Hey, this is all cool and everything. And it's interesting. And I think, you know, yeah, it's stimulating the darker elements of philosophy and the religion that you believe in, or, you know, the philosophy you believe that stimulates you and you think it's cool to use as imagery and lyrically, um, it's more creeping and eerie and it fits more, it more fits the aggressive attitude of, of metal and everything than, you know, you know, even though I think Saxon's a great band and it's one of my favorite bands of all time. But if you think it's more interesting and more creepy and stimulating um, uh, than, than, you know, the Razor Fist, the metal bands like Saxon or, you know, the girly hair bands that only talk about, you know, banging underage girls in the backseat of a car. Um, so you guys, yeah, that's what you guys are doing is cool. I'm into it. But why is it wrong if I say, hey, um, everyone is going to face the inevitable moment at some point in life in their life, whether it's later, sooner or too soon, you know, um, that where you are going to disincarnate, you are no longer going to be whatever intelligence is it is in that body that that you're speaking through, you're making your music through, that's dealing with your mom and dad and your cousins through or your best friends and that people are looking at and seeing if you're not catatonic, um, that that energy is going to leave that body that that's whether it's in, in there or it's just your your physical brain or whatever you want to believe um, it's not going to be there. In X amount, in some day, at some point in your existence here on this time and space that you're living in the, the flesh and in this world of and this arid wilderness of steel and stone, um, it's going to go somewhere. And mm -hmm. nobody has ever proven and even given a glimmer of a laboratorial, factual, evidential, conclusive presentation or even a formula a video or any kind of laboratorial evidence of exactly what happens and where you go once that energy that is you whatever it is that's speaking and thinking and talking when it disincarnates from your body because medically it is proven that you are automatically seven ounces underweight every single human being on the planet the minute your heart stops and you stop breathing you're what, automatically seven ounces underweight and there's no explanation. It is, it is not laboratorily calculable. It's not science and medicine doesn't know why, what it is that automatically is seven ounces underweight where, whatever it is that's there that they can't diagnose or, you know, that can't, they can't see on some kind of a, you know, captive meter of some kind of, they don't know what it is, where what it is, and where it goes. Whatever, you maybe it's your energy, yeah. it's your intelligence. Yeah. So yeah. nobody can say where you go. Nobody yeah. can determine. Nobody, nobody has ever come up with any evidence that there is a superior being in the universe, some superior power that you know controls us all and controls everything. And it's the great architect that has created all mm -hmm. existence that exists before time and space as we know it has ever existed and will exist for eternity. And we are all at the mercy of this incredibly, you know, this, this great power force or intelligence yeah. that people believe is God and that it's all just and right and rewarding if you're good and d destruct, you know, uh, punishing if you're bad, nobody can prove any of that. And that 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 this energy, this being even exists just as much as no one can prove that there's a Satan or a negative power, that some negative being, um, whether it's, you know, um, interpreted as the, the, the Lucifer in the Bible that was cast out of heaven because he believed that he was better than God, that God was a, 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 a nitwit and that he was just, you know, um, not a, you know, uh, not up to the Joneses and that. He was more intelligent, more beautiful, or, <laughs> yes. you know, and he made better music and all that. That can't, that certainly can't be proven. And when somebody can produce, you know, a, a laboratorial evidential video or some kind of ev laboratorial evidence, you know, really proven scientifically that, you know, that there's a Satan, that he comes out like a huge monster coming to breathe in fire or that, he, that you know, it's, uh, you, you know, 
John uh, Al Pacino and, and yeah. <laughs> John, John, I'm going to pause you right there. Okay. Sure. Um, sure. I'm going to pause you right there. I, I, that's why I wanted to talk to you because I like your deep thoughts. You know, you, they, they, they align with the sure. way I kind of think, you know, I just like to think about everything. I'm going to jump around a bit if it's okay with you. I, I was reading a post, sure. uh, you know, in your years in Megadeth. And I found this fascinating that this piece of history sort of, it's not really discussed much, you know, and maybe you could touch upon that. I'd love to hear about it. You know, your sort of time singing with Megadeth and uh, David Alveson or the two Daves, right? Uh, sure. So, so you're, you're there. I know they're look, look, I've talked to Mustaine. I've talked to Alveson, not about this, but I've just talked to them in general. And I, I just find that this, this kind of, this piece of history just kind of gets glossed over quickly. Right. But I know there's more to it than that. And maybe you could talk about when you first sort of started working with these guys and how that played out. Well, um, they were regulars on the LA circuit. Um, well, they started to, to be, to play a couple of shows out here and there. They put together the first band after Dave was out of Metallica. Um, they, you know, um, they knew Juan Garcia and me. They knew um, they, you know, did go out and see all the local bands, you know, just to hang out and have a place to go and shoot the shit or have a beer or whatever. And um, so they, you know, they they saw all the bands. They saw everyone from you know like Rough Cut to the more you know the more posy bands like Rat, and then you know I'm sure they've been to few many Motley Crue show, you know, club shows and. Um, they just as much as they like the heavier bands like Avatar, you know, mm -hmm. a really cool band I was in um, with some awesome guys. Some, Mark Caro, guitarist, was just an incredible genius virtuoso for the time and always will be. And uh, I was just, you know, it was I landed a job with that band, you know, from um, an ad in the Recycler. It's a local newspaper in L.A. where, you know, if you're, you know, it's like uh Bands seeking vocalists, vocalists seeking bands, you know, guitarists seek bands or whatever you could. That was where you put together, you made contact with the local musicians in Southern California to audition or, you know, to audition for or, you know, bring people to audition for you, you know, if you're having your own band. And so, yeah, you know, I, I played guitar many years and uh, for you know strange reasons i didn't want to get into i had to put the guitar away for a while and uh you know i sold i i had a lot of nice equipment i had a lot of charvel guitars that were custom handmade you know for me and i had two marshall stacks and a lot of you know pedal gear you know i had a lot of nice you know pedals you know effects mm -hmm. and everything and i just sold everything and i had you know after i bought what i was you know when I sold everything to buy, I sold all my guitars. I sold my Marshall, everything. Um, sorry about that. And uh, um, I had eighty bucks left, and I bought a sh a, a Shure microphone. <laughs> you know, that was my first microphone because you know I used to drive around with my friends. You know, going to you know going to play, going to rehearsals or, or club shows where we're in. My friends always used to say, you know, I used to put on. Judas Priest or, you know, even sax. And I used to put on bands that I like Rush. And I would sing along to, uh, the, that, at that time, cassettes. I had a cassette player in my car. And they would say, wow, man, you know, I don't want to, you know, I hope I'm not offending you. But, you know, because I know you're the guitar man. You love guitar. You live, breathe, and eat guitar 24-7, 365. And, uh, uh, but, you, you know, you're singing. I mean, you can sing right with the, I can't believe you're singing with these guys. You know, you're, wow man it's you know you can hit those notes and you can you're singing all the all the octaves and everything you you ever thought of being a singer you know and i thought hey man that's you know i say and one of my best friends that i always used to go out with was you know i pick him up he was my roadie basically my guitar roadie and guitar tech and everything and uh he said you know i i don't i hope i don't offend you but I, you're you're singing it's even better than your guitar playing man you know and i, I pulled the car over i said yeah, get out of my car 
I was just kidding. I thought, you know, are you shitting me, man? He said, no, I swear, man. I, I Maybe you do it because you just got used to it, singing in the car, driving here and there. But you got it. You got it down, brother. You know, and I was like, uh, OK, man, whatever, you know. But so, you know, I'd audition hundreds of singers in L.A. from the good, the bad, the ugly, everybody. And I never found a singer that w could sing, you know, my lyrics and sing the parts, you know, to the songs that I'd written. Um exactly the way or even close to the way i imagined it that I, the vision that i had for the the vocals you know to be worked and uh that's why i thought hey i'm just going to give it a go i had never rehearsed a vocal i just sang along with the sets and in my car and when yeah, i bought yeah. that 80 dollar mic you know i auditioned for abattoir and that's where dave mustaine first saw me i think okay. uh and um he knew juan garcia and uh you know, Juan went from being roadie of Abattoir to the guitarist in Abattoir mm -hmm. because I brought him in that way. You know, that's another story. Um, I met Juan, you know, I auditioned when I auditioned for Abattoir and he was one of the, 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 the it was two roadies they had that were the set, you know, godfather roadies for Abattoir. And uh, I met him out in the parking lot and he gave me a good, you know, confidence coaching before I went in, you know, just do it this way. This is the way they like it. Try to do these songs this way. And, don't do the Lemmy song with I heard your demo. Don't do the Lemmy song too much like Halper. <laughs> do the Lemmy song. It looked like Lemmy, you know, because they did uh, Ace of Spades. It's one of their covers they played. And, uh, you know, and then we became friends. And then they had a guitarist that wasn't very dedicated. And he was flaky. He, he was in another band. I think he was in a, some, a hair band, actually. So a lot of Abtor shows, he, did, he didn't show up to. He said, well, you know, I got to sit this one out, guys. I'm sorry. I'm playing with my other band. So they were always frustrated with the guy and then Juan knew all the songs he was you know he had a, a, a half Marshall stack and he had a BC Rich and he practiced a lot and he knew all the Avatar songs just you know because he liked the band and he was you know he knew he had some covers down he played the basic priest maiden and stuff and uh he said I really want to be in the band John I don't know how to come up you know approach these guys I'm their roadie and I'm their friend and maybe they even you know I don't think they're ever going to accept me as a guitarist you know what do you think you know I I played some some stuff with him, some rehearsals, but you know, I said, "Well, let's get you in there, man." So we wheeled his his uh, his marshal down the street. You know, his half stack. I helped them. You know, we rolled it literally down the street, and you know, on sidewalks at that time, they didn't have a lot of those handicap dips. You know, where you, you mm -hmm. know, it's like smooth for wheelchairs and for people that are, um, you know, um, you know, the handicapped people and stuff that you know have a hard, difficult time. The wheelchairs or you know, they have crutches or whatever. And it's hard to get around. They didn't have those. So we had to pull it, lift it up. And, you know, he was carrying the guitar. They said, let's switch. Let me carry the guitar. You pull the Marshall a little bit. My back's giving in. So he, we got him there. He did the first rehearsal. And then uh, the guys were saying, yeah, you know, but Juan's, you know, he's good. You know, he's practiced rehearsed with us before. But we got a, the, our first show with Slater come from two weeks too soon. And uh, Dave Mustaine's going to be there to check it out. You know, he's a friend of ours. And, uh, you know, of course, we're opening for Slayer. It's a big show, so I don't know if Juan's ready. You know, he's not a professional guitarist. He plays good. But I said, well, you know what, guys? Since you only got two weeks, Juan's my friend now. We've gotten really close. So if Juan doesn't play this show, you're going to have to find yourself another singer. And I don't think you can do that in two weeks. So I got him in from roadie to guitarist, and he debuted with me opening for Slayer. So he kind of owes me. His guitar future, in a way, you know, I'm not. I'm definitely just kidding. Juan's a great talent, and without, with or without me, if you never met me, he'd be just as far as he is. Maybe, yeah, you know, yeah, that's true. He he deserves to be where he is. But that's the where he started out as a guitarist. I helped him out, and you know, and so he's done so much for me. And he helped. He we worked so hard at the beginning of the band's history it's that it just that's far overshadows. Me, you know, debuting him as a guitarist, he, his work was in, incomparable. To, nobody would have gotten us as far as we had if it wasn't for us all, all his hard work, you know, sitting at phone booths and for hours and hours talking to New York, talking to Combat Records, you know, <laughs> all kinds of weird <laughs> time difference. But yeah, Mustaine and uh, Dave Mustaine and Dave Ellison, all, they were a team. They were like Siamese twins. They were always out together. You never saw him. You never saw Dave. Mustaine without Dave Ellison anywhere. I've never seen him. As many years as I've seen him in L.A. And uh, in the day. And, uh, you know, those guys were having a hard time, you know. I didn't know it. 
they were, um, you know, they stayed in my house with me, with me and my parents, you know, my parents' house for a while. And uh, because they were, you know, sleeping in their van. And I only found out after I joined the band, you know, that they were um, because they, they mentioned something kind of like in, in, in secret and they were kind of whispering sitting in the front seat. I was in the back of the van. They drive me home after rehearsals. They pick me up and drive me home. And uh, they were saying, yeah, you got the soap back there. Yeah. yeah, I just got a fresh bottle of it. We got to get to the beach before we got to be up earlier because the police, when they come by, if they see us, they were showering at the beach in the morning. They were sleeping in the van. <laughs> I said, hey, guys, man, are you serious? I, what I just heard? No, 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 man. You guys don't need to stay at the beach. You stay at my house. Are you guys crazy, man? We got an extra room there. He goes, no, man, we can't do that man you're like your parents and everything we can't impose that's why we didn't ask you said, no 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 you i'm insisting now you guys are staying at my house let's go and we can we can write there and everything it's just, we don't have to do the rehearsal was the, was the, band. the band called megadeth at the time of course yeah it yeah. was megadeth so it was yeah. called megadeth and uh you're rehearsing with them mm -hmm. that's what you're saying and they're staying at your parents house right yeah yeah okay. all right that's the way it was. And uh, yeah, they love my mom. And my mom always used to say, yeah, it's a, it's a pleasure having these boys here. These are really good boys. <laughs> well, yeah, they are really nice guys. They're really, they're really polite, very respectful of my family. They never, you know, I, I, in fact, I didn't even see them in the heavy party mode. I mean, whatever they did it, they didn't do it around me. And they were staying at the house. They'd go out sometimes, but they weren't out all night for three days. They'd come, they wouldn't come back with like, you know, black circles in their eyes, you know, vomiting or anything. In fact, I never saw them in a heavy, heavy party. You know, I've never seen, I've never seen them do hard drugs as long as I was in the band rehearsing with them. I've never seen them do hard drugs and all these, you know, their history that everybody was so shocked to eventually learn about if you weren't around them in those days. I've not, I never, I never saw it. I, they were just super, super sweet guys, really nice guys, easy to get along with. Dave was not dictatorial. Like people say, he's really very cool stand-up guy very easy acted very normal i've never seen him you know falling down drunk or you know they they'd go out in the van at rehearsal they knew i didn't like the smoke so they'd go out and do a couple bong hits once in a while but they weren't you know like you know i gotta have a a, a plastic tube attached to my nostrils and i you know and i have to have a bong attached to my lips john during rehearsals and everything i you know if you can't take it you know too what bad. song? No. What I songs were you that. doing in rehearsals? Like, what were you practicing? Like, the "Killing Is My Business" material at the time, or not? There was some um, material that was outside of that. Yeah, that was. I had some stuff that um, I was writing some lyrics to their to their material that was kind of merciful fate. Like, I was kind of going through a dark period in my life at the time, and I really loved Merciful Fate and King yeah, Diamond too. and. Yeah, yeah. yeah, and I I thought yeah this is the, the, a cool band to kind of add some of that kind of element, and I had a song called Into the Abyss that was really cool. I loved that song, and uh, you know it was and and Dave even he said you know hey this is a little bit creepy you know Johnny I think Dave's always been kind of you know on the lighter side. He's always you know he's he's a heavy guy. He's one of the he writes some of the heaviest music ever, of course, and he's you know, the riff master emperor you know and everything and he's just a heavy guy but as far as philosophically and, and the, the whole ambient and you know the being attracted to that darker element of metal um it wasn't dave he was kind of creeped out about it so he was kind of he didn't say much but he was always kind of looking at me like yeah do you really want to do that with that song i mean you know we kind of like the stuff you did in abattoir and you, you, that's why i like you john you're kind of like uh you know, like the, on the lighter side, you're kind of, a, you're not the guy who raises his fist to metal and you're not the guy who's going to tease your hair and, you know, put lipstick on and a sailor's hat and sing about girls. So I thought, but you're not the guy who's singing about Satan either. And I know you're not singing about Satan in this song. You're not literally saying Satan, this and Satan, that, but it sounds kind of creepy, man. <laughs> it's a, it, I wouldn't be, sometimes I close my eyes and I think maybe it's King in the room here, you know? <laughs> so I thought, you know, so I thought, mm, well, Dave, maybe, you know, and, and I, he, he, he's always been kind of like a Christian kind of guy, not a Christian sort of sense of, you know, like, like he, like he became like he was, you know, initiated into later. And when, after I was in the band later years, when that helped him, I guess, get off his, his drug addiction and everything. And, 
you know, God oh, bless them for that. Yeah, yeah absolutely. absolutely. How long were you in the band, like rehearsing with them, playing with them? Did you perform any shows? Um, no, we never did any shows, unfortunately. Uh, it was a, quite a while, maybe almost a year, you know. Wow. And uh, yeah, it was awesome. I mean, every rehearsal just felt like I, I always looked at them, the, you know, Dave, the two Daves playing behind me and I was singing and I thought, and then, you know, the, the drummer was incredible. Dijon Carruthers at the time, it was um, an African-American drummer that was just an incredible talent and a super nice guy. In fact, he was the one that motivated them to follow through with their wanting me in the band because um, I had already had Agent Steel uh, kickstarted at that time. Mm -hmm. uh even before i joined megadeth and you know it, it it all started by them seeing me in abattoir and then they saw they knew i was an agent steel they came to an agent steel rehearsal or two and uh then it started you know they came they brought me aside you know they said they, they called me aside at a rehearsal in santa monica where there was a pool rehearsal place in the day at an agent steel rehearsal and they uh and they said hey john you know you do you ever think about joining us I mean, Agent Steel is a cool band and, you know, Juan's a super cool guy. He's our buddy. But, you know, without wanting to, you know, bring any harm to anyone and step on anybody's toes, you know, you might be able to be in both bands. And I said, what are you guys talking about? He goes, well, we'd love to have you in a Megadeth. I think that 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 would give us a shot at definitely, you know, that would be one of our greatest hopes and of of stepping over Metallica, of crushing Metallica, is if you were the front man, that we that would give us the edge that we need to put us in, you know, in a in a category beyond Metallica, more in like the the, the maiden and priest category. So we would just just devastate. Whereas if I'm, you know, if I was singing, for example, Dave was saying to me, just like that, he was saying to me, you know, you know, to tell you the truth, singing gives me a a headache and give me a sore throat so i could never imagine it but unless we get you as a vocalist not some other guy you know some unknown or some other guy that sings more like uh, aggressively and more you know uh, coarse with your clear singing in the in the high notes and everything like halford singing to in megadeth that would do it we would be instant celebrity we just and we could crush metallica there's no way james could compare with you vocally the range wise, you know, and everything. And, uh, I, I was shocked to hear him, you know, it was like, they were pitching me I said, well, you should think about it, you know? And then Juan came out, you know, there's a parking lot you hang out in between rehearsals and everything. And then Juan got a little suspicious that something was going on, that they pulled me aside to talk to me. And I didn't think it was very serious. I thought maybe, Oh, maybe these guys, you know, I, I, it's so, it's so, um, uh, it's such a privilege that, that these guys, you know, like my singing and they like what I'm doing. And, um, yeah, there was like no words to describe how I felt. I felt like a star right then, you know, that these guys have even considered or talking I, that I, way. I, th I think they would have nailed it, it. it. Yeah, I think it would have been amazing. I mean, do you have any recordings from those rehearsals? You must. There must be some tape recordings of some sort. I wish I did. Um, maybe they recorded something or Dijon recorded something, but um, I don't know. I don't know where they would be. I wish I had something because the, the, oh, we, yeah. and we were kicking ass every night. I mean, it was incredible. The rehearsals were just super. You just were you doing like last busting. rights and killing is my business and the skull beneath the skill skin. Like, were you doing the material that yep. eventually appeared on the first album? Yep. Yeah. Four horsemen. Yeah, well, that's four horsemen yeah. Metallica, yeah. but yeah. yeah. The mechanics. mechanics, yeah, and I had all different lyrics to it. I had all, all the different lyrics, you know, according to my, the way I, you know, the subject matter that I write about. And there was a lot of stuff about aliens and UFOs, all kinds of creepy stuff too. It was more creepy and darker than the Agent Steel material. And uh, you know, yeah, I was writing like you're going to be abducted. And, you know, they're gonna, they're gonna give you a, you know, an anal probe. No, I didn't go there, but you know, they're gonna. <laughs> a needle into your neck and they're gonna you're gonna see your past and your future i had all kinds of really heavy lyrics that you know alien in the, in the alien concept um tradition um that i never use in agent steel and so it was lighter it was more like a crusade for you know there's hope aliens are going to help us evolve as a race so we don't blow ourselves up in nuclear war in the future it was the agent steel concept more more so to say lyrically but with the megadeth 
when I was in Megadeth, I used more of a, you know, no, the aliens are going to bring, they're going to abduct you, bring you into their spaceship, and they're going to tear you apart. <laughs> yeah, basically. So, yeah, it was kind of it was a different attitude. I, I, I would have liked yeah. that. And, you know, I would have liked that. I would have liked that. Who was the guitarist for Megadeth when you were in the band? You know, I brought a friend in because they would they needed the guitarist, you know, and and Dave always said, you know, um, I, I would like to have someone in that's more flashy than I am. Mm -hmm. So because, you know, they've, you know, Metallica, he's always thinking about Metallica, but and he knew that his stuff was flashier and more, um, you know, riffy and more jazzy. So uh, he knew he had an edge. He believed he had an edge. And I think he's an incredible, yes. you know, legendary talent. Uh, in, on guitar and songwriting so you know i love metallica too i love their material they're one of the greatest metal bands ever um in, in the they started the, the great heavy riff master kind of stuff they went beyond iron maiden judas priest is more melodic and just the heavy metal original metal gods you know of course but metallica took it a notch beyond and uh then everybody was influenced by that more aggressive faster yep. uh tempo genre of metal because of Metallica, yeah. but Megadeth, because Dave had been kicked out of the band, was in the back, you know, in, in the back line, not getting a chance to show, you know, his how fast he could sling his gun. So, you know, he was always very excited, always very energized about, yeah, I'm going to blow these guys away, man. My stuff's jazzier, riffier, riffier and just more unique. You know, I said, I absolutely agree. Your stuff is unique in comparison to Metallica. Metallica was awesome, too, but you know yeah with and then with me with my vocal um work in there it is going to be incredible and uh so he was always you know wondering what on, on that mission know, it, it seems me, like from what you're telling me he was on that mission to like crush metallica even at that stage right because i guess he just got thrown out is that it oh is man it? oh he was you could see he his face would light up and he would just he would suddenly get his fingers would tighten up and he'd start moving his fingers when he talked to you like like uh even if he wasn't holding a guitar and at any time he would just glow he would just you know it was one of, like one of these b horror movies you know where the alien the, you finally figure out that your your friend that you're out camping with you know um out in, out in the boonies that he, he's possessed by an alien his eyes start <laughs> glowing and fire starts coming out of his eyes you know that's how he would he start acting when he when he talked about competing with metallica that he had you know a, a curveball ready for them that they would never you know, expect and that if they think that his material was the material that they kept, that they released, that got him to to where they were, you know, excelling, that he they hadn't seen nothing yet, that he had that the new material he was going to come out with was just going to they were just going to either quit or they were going to be ashamed. You know, that's how he talked. He was like very confident and very positive. So I love James and Lars. I love those are my brothers forever, but they got some they got they better prepare you know they better put their heads between their between their legs and kiss their own asses goodbye because i'm just gonna fucking tear them off the stage i'm just gonna so, tear the world apart yeah so he, you're rehearsing you're, confident. How, how many nights a week you're rehearsing rehearsing about for a year like two three nights a week oh we rehearsed a, a lot at first um it was at least three or four nights a week um they were very de dedicated these guys i mean they live breathe and eat the stuff if they're not you know, planning, um, you know, engineering, plotting songs. And, you know, we, 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 we sat after rehearsal. A lot of times we'd go to Denny's or um, there's a place on Sunset Boulevard in L.A. I don't even know if it's still there. It's called Ben Frank's. And uh, th they used to like going there instead of Denny's somewhere by, the you know, the beach or something. is because uh, there was a lot of girls, like a lot of uh, hair band girls that would that would go there to eat after like some show at um uh the rainbow or i mean that not the rainbow but uh the what is that place uh i used the whiskey yeah but there's, there's another place that where Trubadour. judas priest even played in, in the 70s not the, the troubadour too but there was another place i forgot what it was called that was a little bit deeper into hollywood where it had the a viper bigger stage room, no. it was a bigger venue no that's nowadays i think that there's i don't know if yeah, it still yeah, exists okay. that was later in into the there's an there's an actual place i saw a poster for it the other day and i remember that place i played there when i was i, I had i played guitar and i had my band we played there 
Um, okay. well, I forgot okay. what it was. Yeah, it's all right. It's all right. Yeah, these so, guys, they, they would go there, you know, to meet girls because they knew that a lot of cute girls would hang out at that Ben Franks on Sunset late into the night because it was 24 hours. And um, they could meet girls there. And actually, they did. They Sometimes they'd meet girls there because, you know, the you know Dave, you know, Dave Mustaine Jr., as everybody call him and Dave included, um, they, you know, they look good. I mean, they, even though they were a heavy band, you know, they played faster than hell and uh, heavy as Metallica and beyond. They, they, if they wanted to, if they put gel in their hair, you know, and they wanted to be, which they would never do and they never have, and they never will. But um, if they wanted to look that way, they could, they just look naturally good with their hair, you know, greasy and straight, you know yeah, yeah but they yeah. look good you know and uh and the girls like them you know a lot of girls like them they were popular you know even though they were a heavy band and uh they kind of treated the girls like yeah you know i play heavy music i'm not into poser shit that you listen to but you're cute we can be friends anyway and the girls would say yeah you guys are pretty cute for a heavy band you know so they <laughs> met girls there and uh so we'd sit around you know and we'd shoot the shit and we'd talk about new songs new song ideas and just about life in general and they, you know, as we were talking, sometimes their eyes would, you know, their head would kind of move sideways and they kind of look past my head and talking to me. They look at the girls in the background and see if they could get someone to look at them, and, you know, which they always did and get some interest. So, yeah, I mean, we hung out and uh, besides just re- rehearsal. So it would kind of we became kind of pretty close friends in that in that sense of the word. And uh, it mm-hmm. was a great experience, man. I loved it. I mean, the music was ki- kick ass. These guys were awesome, incredible shredders. And every night felt like, wow, you know, if I was on stage at a Los Angeles forum with these guys, it would be no different than this rehearsal room. I, I would always think that. I would always mm-hmm. like kind of feel like smiling it, within myself with mm-hmm. these incredible shredders in back of me, just head banging and playing incredible riffs that I've never, never seen before. I've never seen any band that I've ever been in or that i've ever seen live in la or anywhere and subconsciously you did influence them you did influence them subconsciously because rust in peace with i mean their biggest album is you know the alien you know uh yeah you know the theme of the alien still sort of lurking around there on that album right so there was you subconsciously influenced them right or consciously that dave yeah uh, because you know dave's a very intelligent person he's a he's a genius so you know he's he, he, he's he, even in the day he's open-minded to a lot of in, 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 intense subject matter he was wasn't just the guy's like yeah man i just want to play metal let's rock and roll the guy's very intelligent he thinks about political issues society and he's always analyzing stuff and you know in, in a calm way he's not like a radical guy about you know yeah fuck you know i'm, I'm an alt writer or i'm an extreme liberal or anything no he was always kind of centered and he always just analyzed everything yeah. he was very intelligent about an, an, you know, analyzing everything so he he did you know he came what happened was that one day i was so involved with an agent steel that i started pulling back and not going to rehearsals as much we started just becoming more distant they were always looking for me sometimes i'd come home and they'd find they'd gotten a place you know eventually and they weren't staying with me and my parents anymore. And sometimes I'd come home and they'd be there again. I thought, well, are they moving back in? You guys are welcome here. But, you know, they say, no, we're waiting for you, John. We thought, what happened? We, did you know we had rehearsal tonight? And I was like, oh, shit, I forgot, man. It was kind of like a white lie. You know, I'd have to always come up with a white lie about, you know, <laughs> oh, man, I forgot. You know, where have you guys been? You know, we're, we had, we've been looking for an apartment. We got a place finally. And uh, they kind of knew what was going on. I was drifting away because I was more interested in Agent Steel as me and Juan were very, very close friends. And I was so involved with that, that I wasn't really interested in, in continuing Megadeth. They kind of knew it. So when, before being Dave, the way he is very self-confident and, and you know, and very self, self-directed. Um, I think he decided that um, he was going to make the first move before I did. So that historically he could always say, yeah, we let John go instead of John quit. So one day I came home and my mom was kind of really sad because she really liked them. And she she held, she held went, she goes, come over here, look. And she picked up a manila envelope from the kitchen. She said, look, the, the boys brought this over, Dave, the Daves. 
they gave it to me and they were kind of almost crying, you know, Dave Mustaine especially was really sad. And, and uh, Dave Ellison was very apologetic. And he said, Hey, you know, is John here? No. She said, no, he's not here. You guys want to come in? He said, no, not today. Um, can you just give him this envelope? Um, Cause I, I gave him a copy of my lyrics all the time. They had copies of them. And, uh, and he said, can you just give me, we're returning his lyrics because we have to let him go because um, it's hard to explain. We love him. We love John. He's become our friend and he's a great singer. And we know that he's, you know, developing the, the age of steel thing right now. And Juan's our, our, our good friend too. And we don't want to stand their way, but the real reason is, is because after a lot of thought, um, I don't know if I, it's kind of creepy for me. My mom, this is what my mom told me anyway, that Dave Mustaine actually told her this. It's it's a little bit too creepy for me. I'm more into like the punk political, you know, and society kind of like our personal life experience kind of lyrical concept. And I don't know if I can really go with this alien thing. It's not only creepy, it's, it's even more creepy than the satanic stuff. It's kind of weird. And I don't know if I want to, you know, campaign Megadeth based on this whole alien thing. And you know, and then just besides that, you know, I don't want to stand in a, the way of Agent Steel. I don't want him to have to decide between Megadeth and Agent Steel. So we're letting him go. Tell him we love him and he's always welcome to rehearsals or he's still our friend. You know, hope he doesn't take this as a as personally like a gesture of, you know, as cutting off their friendship or anything. Um, so, you know, and he just left the envelope and with my lyrics were in it with my mom. And uh, I, my mom said, you know, it was really sad. Why did you, you know, do this to the boys or whatever? I said, why can't you just write? <laughs> why, why couldn't you write stuff? I was really looking forward to you being in that band. I love those guys. They're good boys. And they really <laughs> like you, John, and everything. They like one and everything. So I said, yeah, well, that's just the way it goes, man. You know, I'm going to do this Agent Steel thing. That's my own band, me and Juan and Chuck. And uh, we're just going to campaign this alien thing all the way to the hilt. Because <laughs> uh, it's new and it's new. Let Dave do his. <laughs> let David do his political stuff. Uh, uh, like I want to go through the whole Agent Steel sort of history later on in part two, if you're okay with that. Sure. But yeah. Let's go back to the new album, right? When do you think this this album will be released? Well, it sometime this year. The what I'm thinking of doing is, um, since there's a lot of, you know, it just feels like I'm I'm I'm, 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 I'm blacklisted. And I don't know where it's coming from. You know, I, I, I know that, um, you know, some people say that Juan doesn't want me to continue with Agent Steel because he feels like he worked on it for so long and even beyond me in the, in the era where uh, Bruce Hall was the singer. They, they made those three albums that were, that were awesome. You know, those three albums they made that I didn't sing on. Um, but, you know, some people have a theory. There's a different theories going on out there. Um, but I don't believe that Juan has always been, he's always going to be, you know, one of my number one best friends. You know, I love Juan. He's an incredible human being, an incredible musician. His guitar work has, has evolved incredibly. He's, a, a, you know, a master guitarist now in comparison to when he first started, which he was already great. He's a natural talent, but he, he's so awesome nowadays. And so he's an incredible guitarist nowadays. He's evolved. And he's so humble and body count. He's, a great, count, he's like, a great. Oh he's, yeah, he's got some great. Yeah. Oh yeah, and you know it, all the stuff that he's done. All you know, he's helped played on different, you know, sad and different session work and everything, and played different bands, helping out and everything. But um, a lot of people think that um, that you know the theory is that it's Juan. You know, he has contacts. He knows a lot of people, um, and he's very well liked in the industry and amongst the peers and you know he's made a few moves you know you know uh, in in the shadows and maybe not directly campaigned and gone on youtube and says stop john don't let him continue agent steel agent steel shouldn't be what should not be without without me and bernie and after what happened to bernie it's kind of sacrilegious to continue agent steel um no i don't believe that's juan's position i don't believe that he's involved you know in any of some of that kind of campaign against me mm -hmm. um but some people think it is you know, like an old friend of mine that knows the two of us from, from way back, you know, um, I'm not going to mention who he is by name, but he is, you know, determined to convince me that that is the one is doing all of this blacklisting me in the industry and amongst the peers so that nobody supports me. And it's almost impossible. You know, I'm kind of like uh, uh, being put in the position where I'm kind of like the Edward Snowden of heavy metal, you know? <laughs> yeah. So, uh, 
Yeah, the only place I can li- do is it, take a secret flight to Moscow and be subjected to the, you know, tyranny there, in, or you know, live in the states and be dissected, you know, live, you know. So, but um, uh, you know, that's what you know. It it it, it, it to, to be honest, that's what it seems like. So, but it's not Juan involved. It's something going on out there that um, I think it's you know, I don't know. Some people say it's an ex manager of mine that was kind of an older guy to begin with, and back in the eighties, and he's gone bonkers and. He's stealing all my royalties, and now he's passed away. And his let his but, but his uh, looking estate, at his looking at the other side, right? You know, Juan went on without yeah. you, right? So it's kind of like the same thing. You, you know, like you know, he went on without you with those three albums, and you probably weren't too happy about that, right? And now you're going on without him. So well, maybe you know, it's, it's the same sort of argument, right? Yeah, well, you know, um, I, 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 I kind of authorized after a while. I thought, well, you know, these guys are my friends, and I'm not doing some, anything right now at the moment. So I kind of authorized the use of the okay. name for right. those three albums. But I, I didn't expect not to receive anything, though. I thought that they would give me something. They would throw me some kind of percentage, but they never did. But it's okay, man. I mean, it's, you know, sh- shit happens, and I didn't really expect it anyway. But, you know, I didn't, I, I didn't expect them to, you know. To, to continue and they didn't and we did the reunion we got back together and i wish that had worked out but no no i mean it's uh um you know i i've invited juan to come on uh, oh. even before the no no the gods album um i invited him to come on if he ever wants to come on the door is always open to him if he you know of course agent steel would never would never be the same agent steel no matter what kind of lineup i got if i got you know steve Vai and carrie king to play <laughs> and uh you know you know, uh, uh, Paul Bostoff is one of the great, my, it's one of my favorite drummers of all time. It's not even oh, Dave yeah. Lombardo. I mean, I love Dave. He's awesome. But Paul Bostoff to me, in my opinion, is the greatest Slayer drummer ever. I mean, he's some incredible jazz progressive, you know, all kinds of like uh, actual music being, he's like leading the music in the one, one of my favorite Slayer albums, uh, Diabolus and Musica. It's one of, that's my favorite Slayer album. And it's so outside the box. And Paul Bossoff is an incredible talent on that album. It seems like he's leading the way. Like he wrote the songs and the guys are playing with him. It's just so progressive, but also so heavy and, and raw and, and, and dark. And it's incredible. But um, if I put a line to, a lineup together like that, it would never compare to a lineup that, where Juan was involved. Because me and Juan, I, I, we're like, like the, the Jaggers Richard richards combination yes you know it's just like we can do our own thing and we you know we can sell you know a couple albums and we can reach some kind of you know recognition and success but together we sell out eighty thousand seaters every night you know what i'm saying that's symbolically speaking i don't know we, if we'd reach that kind of status no, but I know who what knows you're you know i'm just saying i'm um, just saying so but the door is open to him he's always welcome to play a solo to write a song to come in and just play a rhythm or to join completely and you know i would follow his lead he's got so much experience much more than me in the in the business and he knows so many you know incredible uh he's all the peers support him everybody likes juan he's a great guy so the door is always open for juan to come back into the band if i you know what what, whatever i'm doing with the band that's very respectable so very respectable that's good i'm happy yeah, well, that's the way it should be, you know. I, yeah, yeah, yeah. My um, right. commitment to our friendship is not uh, friendship is not something that is limited by time and space and the length of years. He's and so, you know, his commitment to the band and what he's done for me, he's been there for me in the toughest times of my life. Um, so it goes beyond just music, you know. He's just a wonderful friend. He's a great friend to have because if you need a friend, that's one of the kind of people. He's the kind of friend that'll be there and he'll jump in front of bullets for you if you need it. So, Juan's Enjoy. always in. Yep. As we have like two minutes left here, there's a picture of you with this sort of like alien Christmas tree. What is that? What's that image? No, it's all metal. It's all um, some uh, like gold platelets and um, uh, a silver, you know, tr- uh, sterling silver and all metal. You know, um it's all metal objects that were put together and a robot sort of shape was made from just all metal objects, whether mm-hmm. it's forks, knives, plates, uh, 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 platters, um, everything metal that you could imagine um, was put together and a, a kind of robot was made that's called um, 
the warrior of peace and uh, okay. a, f- a friend of mine yeah created that and it's uh, energized it's this this person's a very special person um he i can't explain right now in a couple minutes what he does but um we'll talk about he's it a next time person it's okay that, yeah, yeah, and he created that robot. So I'm standing, taking a picture in front of it because very few people were ever privileged to take a picture in front of that kind of robot or you know statue that he created with all those metals. And those metals are all bent into each other. They kind of, you know, there's if you look really close, you can see they're all bent in um, very unique shapes. Some of them like yeah. flowers or bent. Oh, that's it's, pretty cool. And it's impossible to do that with machines. Yeah, a machine oh, cannot cool. do that. By the I time. Sure- yeah, I shared you the picture. That... Sorry, sorry, sorry. Yeah. Uh, no, no, go ahead. I, I shared the picture of the UFO that I saw uh, with you. I'm not sure if you saw that or not, but I'll talk about that next time. I, I took wow. a picture yeah, and there's an object. I'd love to hear about it. Yeah, yeah. Really? So listen, the new their GoFundMe page, I'm going to end off with this. So the new album is, is almost complete. GoFundMe page is up to help support the album to get it completed, right? And out there, you're telling Please. me that there's going to be, there's, <laughs> yes, yes, I'll put that link there too. Also, uh, the new album should be released in 2023, right? As the date you're kind of aiming for, correct? Right, yeah. I'm going to release songs, uh, you know, clips before that and see if some of these idiots in the uh, that that are running these these metal labels nowadays, you know, uh, can get some courage up after they go see the wizard that you know, uh, the coward like the cowardly lion he needs to go see the wizard first before he can get the courage to do something <laughs> substantial and uh if if any of these idiots can step up to the plate and then maybe they can you know drop a call to one and get them come in and play a couple solos or write a song or two add it on and we can add on to it um i think they can make a few bucks you know rather than going after a lot of these unknown bands you know that maybe they're not as talented or they don't they don't have a following they don't have you know the following we have so that's what i want to inspire but i have to fund it myself and unfortunately and uh, nobody's supporting me on that and i i haven't won the lotto as much as i still as old as i am i still have hope that someday (laughs) i may get that winning ticket and uh same here same here you're not alone my friend (laughs) so i gotta fund the album if the fans want to hear something a finished product that eventually a label, if they're intelligent, if there's, if they can, you know, if the cowardly lion can finally see the wizard, they can step up to the plate to, um, to make a deal with me to release and distribute the album. Until then, I need to fund it myself. If the fans want to hear it, it's completion. Um, they got to help me out with it. That's just the way it goes, or else it's just going to take an eternity to get it done. Just with, you know, considering the, the if, if I want to use my, my job, my salary to pay for it, you know, it's going to take a couple hundred years, but All right. um, <laughs> yeah. I got to run. Thank you hey. so much. We'll do a part two. I'll keep in touch with you. Uh, and uh, you know, everybody out there, go uh, hit that fun, go find me page and uh, support agent steel and John, John Cyrus, my guest. Hey, I appreciate it. Jimmy. Really appreciate it. Been a pleasure, my friend. Thank you.